good evening. It's lovely to see so many people taking the time on a Sunday evening to come here and to learn how to compose. That is a beautiful thing. Thank you all for your time and welcome to this event. Uh, uh, Green Cell has been doing these uh, sessions so often and um, this is one of our uh, uh, first initiatives of going to a subdivision and to a community like yours and talking about um, uh, composting. I hope you find it useful. Um, you can interrupt me at any point in time. As you will realize as I talk, I don't take a break. I'm almost breathless as I go along. Okay, mm -hmm. so you think, oh, she's going to pause now and I can ask a question now that doesn't happen. <laughs> so please interrupt me at any time. If you have a question, because it, the whole thing of, you can ask the questions in the end means that you forget it by the time the end comes. Yeah? Or then somebody saying, last question, last question, and we run out of time. So please ask a question whenever you want to ask it. No problem at all. And we will start from wherever we left off. Yeah. And as I said earlier, I um, can get very um, impassioned about this thing. And then the volume of the voice just keeps going up. I don't realize it. So suddenly my voice is booming around the neighborhood. It's so quiet and so beautiful. Um, so if you think that I am talking really loudly, that somebody will get annoyed, please stop me down. Yeah? Don't be these nice people who will say, it's all right. It is not all right. Okay? All right. So those two disclaimers always. And then we go right into composting. Now, most people will want the rules. Okay, tell us what we should do, what we should not do, what works, what does not work. Right? My sense is that we are all better off if we started off with the fundamental principles, with the science. Then, whenever you have a doubt, whenever you have a question, you know where to go back and ask. Okay? Composting is about understanding how a set of useful bacteria work to convert everything back to soil. The design of the earth is so beautiful that every living organism, every. The problem is that we fill the earth with non-living objects. That's a separate problem. But the design of the earth is such that every living object will ultimately become soil. So that's the design. Composting is part of that design where whatever living um, uh, you know, uh, organic stuff or stuff that has once lived. Because we pretty much can't eat anything that has not lived. Yeah, I, I'm sure there are vegetarians here, vegans here. You must excuse me for saying this. Because what you don't see um, is also alive and alive and thriving and breathing and walking and moving, right? Just that you don't see it. So there is nothing like vegetarian food that doesn't live. All food lives. Okay, all food is alive. We can't eat anything else. So all of this food after we've eaten, and since we eat only portions of the food, and there is always something left, seeds and pulp and uh, peas, and you know, when we prepare food, we are, we are unable to consume because our digestive system is unable to take some of those things. We can't digest those cellulose, for example. So then we generate food wastes. So composting is a way to convert these into soil. And uh, the primary uh, help you get is from microbial organisms. Billions of them, in one teaspoon of soil, about a billion microorganisms live. So they are present everywhere. They are present in billions. And they work on food to decay it and bring it down. They wouldn't attack. They all know. They all have their territory. So there are, the microbe is not going to be able to affect the fruit, as long as it's completely covered with skin, right? It's not able to affect it. It's not able to penetrate. But the moment you cut the fruit, the fruit is exposed, and in about 20 minutes, microbial action will begin on that fruit, right? So it will start deteriorating from there on because these bacteria will try to break it down, right? So we take the help of this bacteria that microorganisms that can break food down to convert food waste into compost. And when we do this, we prevent a lot of uh, trash from going to the landfill, right? Okay, long introduction. I told you about first principle. 
three things, three things to remember. Every living organism requires three things. Water, air, food. So if you're composting, you are actually encouraging this bacteria to thrive in your backyard and to convert the food waste that you've generated into soil. And they need these three things. So if you don't provide these three things, the bacteria will not thrive, but harm-causing pathogens will start growing. We call that as anaerobic. Now, if you have an anaerobic environment, that is an environment in which there is no air, then most disease-causing pathogens will thrive in that environment, which is why we call it the smell test. You know, we have a beautiful design of the nose near the mouth. So you take food from the smell, you know whether it's good enough to eat, right? So when there is anaerobic harm, disease-causing bacteria, I mean, microorganisms at work, if the smells are, you know, they're they not agreeable. You don't eat them. The same thing happens with compost. The primary complaint most people have about composting is that it's smelly. Good compost is sweet smelly. So if you have smelly compost in your backyard, your bacteria is not getting enough air. Right? So you must ensure air, water, food. It's like any other living organisms. How long can you survive without air? few seconds. few seconds, right? You can survive without water for some time. You can survive without food for some time. But you really cannot survive without air, right? So you want to ensure that these three things are present in your composting bin. Now, how are we going to ensure this, right? That's what the design of the whole process is based on. For example, all your kitchen, let's say the vegetable peels, they are 90% water. So once they start decomposing, and you, let's say you put them in a pile. I mean, I've seen compost bins in which people will take me to their backyard and open it. Whole swarm of flies will get out of it. And there'll be a stinky mass right there at the bottom, which is all squishy and, and bad. Why? Because all your kitchen waste is 90% water. So the moment you drop it somewhere or store it somewhere else, it will immediately decompose and become watery. And you must remember that when the plant, when the cells are all blocked by water, there's no space for air. Right? So the first principle is building air into your compost pile. How are you going to do that? Brown leaves. So you will never compost your kitchen waste without adding to it at least two to three times that volume of what we call browns. So if we call your organic waste as greens, Organic waste is everything, all your peels, your, your clipped nails, the pieces of your hair, everything that has once lived is organic, it can be composted. Everything which has once lived can be composted, right? But when you add that to your bin, you want to make sure that you've added twice or thrice that volume of dried leaves. So here they are. Ganesh loves this question. So when I started my composting class, yeah? Um, uh, people would, would ask, where can I find browns? In Atlanta. Really? Yeah? So you have leaves everywhere. Instead of bagging these and throwing them away, they precious. They contain very precious cellulose and carbon, which enables, and they have so much of nutrition, this is what the trees have worked hard to harvest from the sun and the soil throughout the year. They are absolutely precious. You can put them below the lawn mower to crush them up. That reduces their volume, bag them. And for every handful of kitchen waste, add two to three handfuls of this brown matter. If you are that kind of fussy person, you can have a big bowl in which you're putting this together, mixing them all up and putting them into the compost bin. The bacteria don't care, actually. All that they care about is that they're able to breathe. So if your kitchen waste is going to sit there and become water, there is no space for air, they can't breathe. So anaerobic organisms will take over and the thing will become a stinky mass. So if you add browns, as the water is released, this carbon will start absorbing it. And you must remember that carbon is what provides structure. Is it right? You won't get any compost if there's no carbon. This is what provides the structure. What is left when the whole process is over is when everything has been broken down 
and these leaves have been used for creating that fluffy compost that you will harvest at the end of it, right? So the first principle is to ensure that you have grounds. So use an old bin, an old um, um, or a wire bin that you can create. Make sure that you are able to collect leaves during the fall or even otherwise during the spring cleaning and even now magnolias will start shedding soon enough. So there is not going to be much shortage of leaves. But if you do want to use other browns, you can use uh, shredded paper, you can use newspaper, you can use cardboard, yeah? You can use any of these as browns. Now, for those of you who worried about worry about paint and lead and all of that, those are, those are no longer, these are all like old stories, okay? So, those are all not used, those toxic materials are not used in the production of newspaper, newsprint anymore, okay? So, you can use them. Avoid glossy paper because that's going to take a little time to decompose. So that's the first principle. So you want to mix both of this together. Second thing is moisture. The compost must have enough water to hold it together. Is that right? Now how are you going to ensure that moisture is there? You want to put the compost together in a pile. Keep it together. Keep it collected together. Keep it compacted together in some sense. So that they don't lose moisture too much. So if you have a bin like this, if you have a bin like this, then what happens is that this is a um, this bin is available from any price between sixty to hundred dollars, depending on when what kind of deal you get. Okay, there are friends who bought it for sixty and feel very accomplished having found that deal. Um, uh, it, it, there are others who buy it hundred. You can get this easy to assemble. It has two compartments. So what you do is get your kitchen waste, add the browns and add it to this, right? Typically, your kitchen waste would have generated enough moisture, but when you find, since this is closed, the air, the biggest absorber, I mean, the biggest attack on moisture of your compost is air, right? So air will dry out the compost. So you want to have a bin, a wire bin, a bin like this, or a, 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 pl a plastic bin, or a box, into which you're going to add, generate your compost. But if you use any plastic container, first principle, air, put enough holes, punch enough holes so that your microorganisms can breathe. And remember that plastic is going to kind of keep the things really moist because there isn't, it's not like earthware which is going to breathe, right? So the things are going to be really moist. So make sure that you're adding enough browns, make sure you put enough holes uh, on all the sides. And some people will cautiously put some holes at the bottom and put the composting bin on top of two bricks so that in case there is excess water, the water can drain off. I would advise not doing that because that lechet which comes out is quite precious. It has a lot of nutrition. I would rather that it is in the bin than, you know, draining off. But you can collect that and you can use it in your garden and so on and so forth, right? So managing moisture. Make sure that you have a bin. Make sure it is enclosed. And suppose you have a wire bin. What happens? You will have, let's say you buy a hardware cloth and you wrap it around into a circular bin and then you put, put it all in there. If it, is, if it rains and it is open, it can become soaking wet, right? So the ideal thing is to keep it below trees somewhere and maybe cover it with some cardboard so that it doesn't become soaking wet. It gets some moisture. So with time, you will learn how to keep your compost pile moist. A lot of people ask me, oh, nothing is happening. There is no activity in my backyard. That's because there's no moisture at all. You know, just sprinkling a little water will get it all activated, right? So moisture. Third, food. What you are putting from the kitchen is food, right? But there are some fermented foods that have a higher level of active bacteria that can help your compost. Right? It can be anything fermented. Right? It can be. You should interrupt any time. So you're saying that the scrapes and everything, all the food you're putting in, it has natural water in it, right? That's right. But Ninety percent of it is water. So that water is not going to be enough to compose. You're saying you need to add some additional. You have to check. Okay. It mostly is enough. Right. But what can happen is you must remember the wind. Right. See, if your bin is plastic, you may pretty much not need anything. Okay. But let's say you have a wire bin. A wire bin which is open from all sides. So wind is blowing from all sides, so your compost will go dry. So it will be moist in the center, 
but it will be all dry on the sides. So you might have to, you know, direct your garden hose to just moisten it. Yeah, so you, yes, you make sure it's not bone dry. Make sure, we say squeeze sponge. So if you're going to touch the compost, it should be moist but not wet. Because moist means your bacteria has enough water. Wet means the air pockets are getting seeped. So you must know the difference. Yeah. So as I said, that little science you should know. And so the food, any fermented food is, is nice for the compost. So you can add, um, uh, you know, um, yogurt, you can add your kombuchas and any of those uh, pickles. and All of those will have, um, you know, fermented bacteria that will help. For those of you who are particular, you can get EM from the store. You can order at Amazon, effective microorganisms. They're available in a, in a liquid form as well as in solid form. Just sprinkle a little bit. You, 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 of course, marketing is a big art, right? But effective microorganisms is actually soil. You can just walk to your garden, pick up a handful of soil and sprinkle it on your compost. You're inoculated. <laughs> yeah? So you can, I don't know, people are asking me, is that potting mix? No, sir. It's not potting mix because potting mix is like sterile. That's something that amazes me in this country. I'm fairly new here, so it's my fifth year here. So there are suppliers that send you soil. But there's no sign of life in it. None. There's no nothing living there. When I ask the vendors, they say people won't buy if there is there are creepy crawlies. Mm -hmm. So just imagine. Imagine a, 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 a cultural indoctrination that makes you think that soil with life is bad soil. Yeah? The, the truth is just the opposite of it. That soil, so therefore that soil is not going to have microorganisms. So sprinkling that store-bought soil is not going to help you because it doesn't seem to have, they seem to have done something to it to eliminate all the life in it. But walk into your garden from below your trees, from, you know, you, if, you, if, you, if you rake below the trees, you will find layers of beautiful black um, decomposed leaves, which are turned almost black. So they, they are beautiful for your composting, right? Mm -hmm. So food is what you're adding from the kitchen and also the effective microorganisms that you're adding. The microorganisms help, the soil helps getting the compost started, right? Yes, so this is end of part one. Any questions? Yeah. Um, how about soil from like a pond? Like if you have a pond. Absolutely. Oh, it's beautiful because the soil from the pond will also have uh, an additional dose of nitrogen coming from all the aquatic organisms. Okay. Fish will naturally be, the, their, their, their feces is full of nitrogenous matter. So even though it's like really soggy and. It's fine. It's fine. It'll all get it'll all get absorbed and in no time it'll all go dry. Mm -hmm. So no problem. You can add soil from anywhere. So you can add a handful of soil. So if there, are there any other questions from anybody else? So if you have a stationary compost bin, I have a one which is like stationary and they don't turn it too frequently. So is it okay to use air? Your microbes need air. So if you're not turning, so when they say turn the compost, all that you're saying is build some air. So if you look into it, see, you can carefully layer it. See, if you add your greens and browns, as I said, if you have a mixing bowl in which you're mixing the browns and this and adding, you don't have to turn your compost because it's already nicely mixed up such that the browns and the greens have, will settle in and they'll be good. But assume that there is, you know, you've thrown in, for example, I mean, I have somebody called up with panic and saying, there are maggots in my compost bin. Yeah, because you call them. She's put in a whole, a whole old watermelon, an entire watermelon, full of water. So the compost bin doesn't know how to deal with it. So maggots have been called to help. She said, where did they come from? I said, they lived in the fruit. It's just that they came alive. She said, eek. I said, you are eating life all the time. <laughs> They're already there. They're already in the fruit. They just came out to live because the conditions were beautiful for them to be born. Because it was so wet. So they would eat up and then I said, add some brown leaves. She said, it's not good. I said, no, we add some brown leaves. The solution to most composting problems, troubleshooting, is brown leaves. Add brown leaves. The moment you've added brown leaves, the moisture is, has got managed. 
and the maggots will die and decompose and they will enrich that soil further, the compost further, because they have ingested stuff and you know they are so filled with proteins. If you, I said, if you are fat chicken, just feed them. The chicken will be so happy to eat those fat maggots. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, you can. So it's, it's, there's no problem. But uh, if you if you turn the compost, you're just building air, and that will speed it up. It will make your process faster. Yeah, because your microbes are able to breathe. Yeah. If you have a thunder like this one, how often should we turn? Whenever you feel like it. Every time you're throwing some this thing, just give it one turn. Yeah, because you're building some air. You're making sure that things are moving and there's air. With no air, the process will come to a standstill. Yeah, the more air there is, the better. In fact, what some of us do is, suppose you have a bin and you've made a compost in that. What you could do after the bin is full is that make another bin and just transfer this. That process is going to build adequate amount of air, right? Open it up. And then just refill it, fill it right back. So then you've built air and you know you, you will find that your compost is suddenly breaking down very quickly. And particularly times like these in summer, I'll come to that. Okay. So that's that. Now there are a few things the composting microorganisms are fussy about. Yeah, I'll tell you what they are. Okay, first thing is that some of them are there are there are various bacteria that come at various stages, okay. So a certain kind of mesothermic bacteria that work on your compost pile generate heat. So if you have a thermometer and if you test your compost pile, you'll be surprised at temperatures going beyond 100 so easily, yeah, hot. And if you, for example, if you have cut grass, you have left it in a pile in a corner, the next day when you just turn it, you will find it steaming. Because it started, it's so full of nitrogen the bacteria will just go into action. The only thing is it become a soggy mess because it is completely green. Yeah. So what happens is that these, this, there's heat that gets generated, right? So the activity is fast if heat is generated, and there is only one condition for heat to be generated. Any guesses? Volume. Volume. Your compost pile must be at least three cubic feet, three by three by three, at least. This is the minimum size you can have. So there are people who try to compost in little yogurt jars and ask me why it has not changed. There isn't enough volume for the mesothermic bacteria. That will also decompose eventually. But if you want a fair, fast, efficient process, if you have volume, if you have bins that are 3 by 3 or 4 by 4 or if you have volume, you'll find it happening faster. Right? You're, you're going to enable and if it's compacted, kept together, yeah, moist and if it has volume, you will find it happening faster, right? So uh, that's the one thing. And the second thing is that all manures will speed up the compost. If you can tolerate that idea, you can bring in rabbit poop or the manure of herbivorous animals. Dog poop sadly won't work. So like root poop from, from the ground? Yes. So rabbit. In India, there is a great demand for elephant poop, the largest known carnivore, herbivore, right? Um, it produces abundantly every day. So, horse manure, cow manure, goat manure, all of these are compost enhancers. So, you can add, uh, you can add um, uh, chicken manure. So, you can add manure to your compost as a way to speed up the process because manures will generate heat. The composting bacteria love that heat and so the process becomes faster and there are enough effective microorganisms in manure which will speed up the, uh, the composting process and no manure should be applied to any food garden unless it is composted because it can have pathogens so you should not add any manure directly to your plants to at least the vegetable garden. You can add them to your roses and to the flowers, but not to the vegetable garden. They can have pathogens. You want to wait for them to compost. So it's the second thing. Third thing to remember is the yin and yang. The way in which the garden works is that the plant loves the light and the sun. The microorganisms that work on the soil, like the cool and the dark. So dark are the place. Don't put your compost bin right in the middle of the of light. 
keep it in the shade keep it below the trees word of caution here the moment you have your bin below the trees and the compost is ready the tree will send a good amount of roots right into your compost bin and steal all your compost so when you go to harvest you will find that it is completely matted with white roots of the tree which has come in and happily taken all the compost so if you have it below the tree make sure that you have a barrier at the bottom you have stones or you have a, a, a thick sheet of cardboard or plastic or whatever you know so that the tree is not able to send roots and harvest your compost but keep it in shape so that is the end of part 2 so you want to make sure that your compost is in a cool dark place you want to make sure that you have added some some um uh, you know manure or other things that can enhance it and you want to make sure that there is adequate volume therefore a bin like this you can buy any bin a bin like this is going to help you take care of all of these things right so that's that so you're ready to start you don't have to buy a bin you can simply get a hardware class that make a bin if you like you can just put it in a corner you can build it with a piece of wood right you can use a a a, a five gallon bucket to begin with it's going to take some time right you can, can to begin with and then later buy your uh, right so that is end of part 2 that's all there is to composting i'm not going to come to do's and don'ts and troubleshooting and all of that and i'll show you a demo as well as to how we are going to uh, mix the two together the kitchen waste and and then i'll pass around samples of plain soil and compost so you're able to see it yes Yes. Material. Yes. I mean, yes. I was going to. A, a rich soil will have plenty of worms. <laughs> yeah. So there is. Um, there are actually three ways to compost. Okay. One is the simple anaerobic throw and forget composting. So you have a pile at the corner of your garden. You're not turning it. You're not doing anything to it. You're just adding all your garden waste and just keeping it there. Eventually. So once in a year, so you start doing it from now. By next spring, you will have compost. Yeah. So that's one way of doing it. The easiest way to do it, very practical, and keeps make sure that all your garden waste are to compost. The second one is what I have explained now: the aerobic composting, which is the most popular household composting method. Yeah. There is a third way to compost. My friend Ganesh is a specialist on that. Yeah. So there are worms. There are special red wriggler worms. which are super composters they generate the top quality compost that plants love called vermi compost vermi compost is the best compost you can get because not only is the material broken down but it has gone through an animal's gut so it's plant ready right so it's it's completely plant ready all food has to pass through another organisms for it to be bioavailable to another that's again nature's design that's how things go so therefore you get these special red wrigglers they very fussy you see that that's called the worm tower that's actually you know you can keep building it you know to five or six levels they very fussy little creatures the the worms there they don't like the cold they don't like um, onions garlic lemon they crawl right out if you add garlic to their bin so you have bins like this and there are I, I, the regulars are not there no yeah it's empty so there is a pile this is called a worm tower so you can buy red wrigglers or you can go and get horse manure horse manure is a natural source of the red wrigglers so you can get horse manure you create a bed at the bottom a brown bed with straw and uh, you know all all around dried leaves etc you create a bed at the bottom and then you keep some food in the corner they are very shy they don't like the light and then you release the worms into it they worry shit these days so in 45 days you will have compost they will just nicely break it all down and they multiply as food is available they'll multiply and as food supplies fall they will their populations will fall then they will break it all down completely i can show you a sample of how the worm compost looks like so those are the composting worms so you don't really you don't really add worms to the compost because the pile is too hot for them to live but worms will come in when your compost is ready when the compost is ready and it cools down you will find worms are able to live there yeah you had a question you said to put food in the corner for the worms yeah what is their food yeah uh, it anything any peels they love watermelon peels and carrot peels and cucumber peels they like that kind of 
bland sugary food yes but then the, the, the scraps but then the thing is that they are tiny they're very very tiny the food has to be chopped fine you can't really add large portions they take a lot of time that's true for the compost as well when you have smaller portions when you have your food scraps cut into pieces when you have the leaves crushed the process is faster things decompose faster that's more so for the worms yeah all right so are there any other questions okay so the thing is that um, again uh, you know I, I volunteer to help people with composting that's true for all of you now today green cell has made it its mandate to go and help people who want to so we can actually have we have a system of mentor and mentees so there are people in the green cell who are trained who know how composting works who will take you on as a mentee and help you with your composting process so when some of us go and see take, come and take a look at my compost then when you go and open the bin there's something right at the bottom nothing has happened the thing is 90 percent oh this is, uh, this is empty but what happens is there are two two compartments here the food that you put in loses 90 percent of its volume as it decomposes you get it because yes. most of it is water so it completely loses so as you add stuff it loses volume so you keep topping it up you get it you have to keep topping it up so it's not a batch process it's not like you put in a batch and then you harvest a batch right so you keep adding as it goes down it will keep losing volume and going down and you keep adding your greens and browns to the to one side when you reach a point where you cannot add any more then you let that cook and you start the other side by the time you finish this side that should be done so you can harvest the compost from that side while this is so you can you can use the bin to close one side and harvest one so, side but when, when one is ready you have to scoop it up with your thing because this is getting ready you cannot just tilt it and bring it down you can the lid is a sliding lid okay so you can close one part of it yeah you can close this, this and, and harvest this okay and you can you can just turn it down and harvest just one side yeah, yeah. all right if there are no other questions, I'm going to address most commonly asked questions. What can I put and what can I not put? Okay. You, as I said, anything that has once lived can go in. There are some exceptions to the rule, particularly milk products and meat. The problem with both of these things is that they putrefy when they decompose. So they will release very strong smells. So if there are critters in your yard, they will be attracted to these smells and the critters are known to you know a raccoon can open this a raccoon will learn to open this and uh, there are critters that make holes persistently make holes so you want to avoid putting too much of it you can throw in a bar of you know rotting cheese there's no problem as long as it's hidden right in covered nicely with browns so that you know and it's not too much we have this rule of how much is it compared to what you're having so you can't really throw in too much so a few bones which are there in your food you know fish bones when you're cleaning up fish heads when you're cleaning up fish you can throw all of them don't throw too much of meats and milk products because they will putrefy they will attract critters they will release strong smells that can uh, you know what should i say that can get so because the rats come then the snakes will come behind them and then there are families that say we don't want to have a compost bin because there are snakes it all depends on what you are uh, otherwise i've been composting here ever since i came with five years and i haven't seen a single uh, critter at the compost bin my compost is in the garden so make sure that so these are things so cooked food the same thing when the food is cooked the cellular structure of the food has already been destroyed so it doesn't decompose as efficiently as uncooked food so don't add too much it, it cools down the compost right it becomes a mass for it to become airy and fluffy is an effort so you can put in a few leftovers but do not make it a habit to dump leftovers into your compost bin don't put too much of it so cooked food meats and dairy you want to put less of it and um, as we said at the start diversity is also very important where you want to the the different things that go into the compost the better the quality of it will be so if you're a juicing household and you're putting regularly putting in 
uh, orange peels and into your compost. So it's going to slow down the process because citrus kills bacteria. Citrus is an antibacterial agent. So the compost will take some amount of citrus peel, but it cannot manage, you know, an everyday dose of citrus peels. So make sure that you put a diverse set of things. Don't overdo the same thing. Everything can be put in with the exception of what I just said. This question. The other second most often asked question is, how long for it to be ready? When will it be ready? Compost can happen from anything from 45 days, 60 days to 6 months. It all depends on what you've put and what the ambient conditions there are. In the summer, when temperatures are good, the process is fast. In the winter, the bacteria requires temperatures of at least 60. So when temperatures drop, the process will, would be stalled. You know, the process won't happen. So typically what you should do, it depends on what you're using the compost for. Most of us use it at our gardens. So the idea is to apply compost to the garden twice a year, once in the spring and once in the fall. That's how our cropping pattern is. So if you have any of these compost bins, you should be able to get two harvests of absolutely fulfilling compost every year. And that's a good target to meet. So don't make it into a, uh, into a thing where, you know, every 45 days I should be harvesting compost, otherwise I'm a failure. There's no such thing, yeah? Um, so uh, give yourself that time and uh, it should be fine. The third most often asked question is flies. Fruit flies will come in the moment there is sugary food that is exposed to air. They will, they will be born, all right? when that condition happens. So please make sure that your top layer is browns. Like when you add food, just take a handful of leaves and make sure that you, you don't have any food that is exposed to air. All right? And you will be able to control flies tremendously if you were able to do that. But if they do come in, don't worry too much about it. But people say, there are creepy crawlies inside my compost. Don't look inside. <laughs> It's fine. They will all they'll all work there and they'll all die and they will all decompose and you will have compost at the end of it. Is that right? So it's all fine. As long as its activity is going on there, just let it be. Yeah, these are the three most commonly asked questions. My friends in Green Cell, is there anything I've missed, Ganesh? Any frequently asked question that I must have missed? Anybody else? Huh. So could you ask me that question? There are people who will place the compost at the end of the yard. When do we remember to throw things in the compost? In the night. And then you will walk all the way and then you will say, you know, that there are, there were snakes in the yard or it was dangerous and, you know, for me to go in. Or worse, people will keep the kitchen waste tied up in a plastic bag and it will all be waiting to be added. So you're allowing food to deteriorate before it decomposes. Because in 20 minutes, food has started deteriorating. So, so and there are people, there are uh, my OCD friends who refrigerate the trash. <laughs> and then they take it to the, you don't have to do any of this. Keep your compost as close to your kitchen door as possible. Trust me, if you manage the moisture and dryness and the food correctly, there'll be no flies, no critters, no smell. Right? It is absolutely safe for you to have your compost bin handy so that end of the day when your trash is fresh, you're able to add food. Just as you will not eat bad quality food, don't feed your microorganisms bad quality food. So they have to struggle to kill all the pathogens, to make it good and make it right again. Why do you want to do that? Add it fresh. A day, that's what I said. See, from a science perspective, your cut food is deteriorating from the 20th minute. Bacterial action has started from the 20th minute. So it doesn't mean that you have to go and fill your compost bin every 20 minutes. But the practical thing is for you to empty it at the end of the day. At the end of a work day, before the sun is down, you don't step into the yard once the sun is down. That's the rule, golden rule. Because all the carnivores and all the cleaning activity, all the... Um, uh, harmful uh, organisms will come out after sunset. So before sunset, you will walk out and throw your day's compost. That's the best practice. Don't allow it to rot. 
before you throw it. Oh, so the fungus and all that is not good. Like if you keep it out. If it's white, it is fine. If it is black, it is bad. That's also good. <laughs> all black fungus is bad. All white fungus is okay. Yeah. As a rule, broadly, there can be exceptions. So throw it off and try and keep your compost bin handy. Don't keep it too far away. Yeah. So you said uh, earlier about the watermelon. Should you tend to like help it and prevent the maggots? Should you like just cut it into smaller it pieces? Them? Yes, absolutely. If you cut it into smaller pieces, mix it up with some browns and added it, it would have happily decomposed and become beautiful. Mm. This one is a whole watermelon. It had so much of water that the maggots had to come into decompose it. How about it's things like bread or or bread rolls? Or yeah, you can throw them into not too much of it because it's cooked food. Yeah. Bread bread rolls is special because it has a lot of air spaces. Yeah. It's already it's cooked in a way that air is built into it. So would you throw like bread you bread just kind of tear it into pieces and put it in? Yeah. 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 Talk about black soldier flies. Oh, black soldier flies. Okay. <laughs> so that's a favorite topic. So the black soldier flies are the ones that um, legs that they they are they are around. The, you you won't miss. You can't miss them when you see them. So you must remember that these are absolutely harmless creatures. I have no idea why people dislike them. They actually can't see, okay? They don't eat. They only reproduce. Once they have laid eggs, they die. That's it. So there is no reason to, you know, wave your hand and worry about them. Their babies are the maggots. So if you have too much of moisture, they get generated. And they will come in to manage that moisture and bring the moisture level of the compost down, and then they would die, right? So the way to prevent it, as I said, is to cover your compost. Make sure that food is not exposed, and um, uh, all these myths—they they don't bite, okay? All these things about you know the flies are biting. No, they don't. Uh, you're not their food, so. This is annoying. <laughs> they are annoying. So you can avoid. You can avoid them. Black soldier flies is an indication that your compost is too moist. Mm -hmm. As I said, add browns. When in doubt, add browns. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let me just show you uh, what is here, and um, uh, we just quickly demo this. So what you have here. So what you have here is plain soil. Okay. So you can see that the soil is heavy, compacted, and its ability to hold water is limited because it is heavy. Now what you have, sorry, thanks. No worries. <laughs> so what you have here is compost. I have brought it. This is finished compost. How will you know it is finished? Um, you will know it is finished because whatever. Uh, this is half done. Okay. So whatever is okay, let me correct that. This is half done. If you can see what you have dropped in, it is half done. Okay? Then I'll show you the finished one. This is half done. Okay. So this one has all right. So these are the stages through which your compost goes through. Can you see? So when you can see what you've put in, you still see those cauliflower stalks there, and it's still cooking. When it is completely done, you can see how fluffy, I'll pass this around. Um, it'll be absolutely fluffy. It can hold 10 times its volume in water. So it kind of uh, helps harvest rainwater for your garden. It's very light and fluffy, and of course it's full of nutrition. So I'll pass these around for you to take a look. You can see the difference in the color. You can see the difference in the color. You can see the difference in the texture. And um, I have brought this compost as it is. I have not sieved it. So what you will typically do. See, for example, there is some eggshell, which is because different things take different amounts of time to decompose. So some of these stalks and leaves or seeds are going to take longer. Right? So what we will typically do is most of us have a compost sieve. So we'll sieve the compost. And whatever are the hard parts, we we'll return them back to the bin to further compost. And whatever is left, you use them in the, uh, yeah, this, this, this kind of thing can be used as a compost sieve as well. 
So we'll um, pass this around for you to take a look at. Um, and you can smell it. They smell like fresh soil after rain. We call it as petrichor. Petrichor is a kind of smell. So all of these were kitchen waste once upon a time. So if you did it right, if you manage the moisture, the air and the food well, your compost will have no, no flying things. It won't stink and it will smell beautiful. So you can take a look. I'll show you. Sorry. I'll show you what we I'll just show it here. These are oh, okay. kitchen waste. Need some more composting. It should almost look like a soil. This is the brown leaves. So if you're going to add it to the bin, you're going to add one handful of the kitchen waste, and you're going to add three handfuls of. So these are crushed leaves. You're going to mix them together like this. And fill up the bin. That's it. Uh, can we keep it on the deck? The, uh, the yes. Tree? Yes. Uh, the sunlight won't uh, affect. You can see the sunlight will affect it, but it's black and it's covered. If you have a bin, like, if if you have a wire bin, that'll be like a lot of sun. So you might have to cover it with a cardboard or something like that. But if you have something like this, this is all fully covered as dark and black. So it's dark inside anyway. So you can keep it, but what you must ensure if you keep it on the deck is keep a tray below okay. because when it rains, this one has holes for air. Okay. So when it rains, uh, you will have a lot of uh, that le lechit, you know, uh -huh. getting collected. Oh, okay. So the dark fluid will come out of the compost bin when it rains, which can stain your um, the deck. The deck. Okay. You can pour it in your garden. You can put that, you can dilute it. Dilute it, the dilution ratio for lechit is 100 times. Wow. Yeah, 100 times. You start selling it <laughs> But it has to be used fresh. So, as soon as, yeah, it loses, it, it just rots pretty much instantaneously. So, if you've had rains yesterday and today morning you wake up and see your tray full, make sure if you're collecting rainwater, great. You just add it to the rainwater and then just water your garden. Yeah, try and use it as soon as you can. There are, how much of compost? You need about an inch twice a year. That's it. So once in April, before you put down your transplant, summer transplant, and once in October before you start your fall garden. Two applications of compost, one inch is more than enough for the garden. You don't have to add anything else. What? What you can also do with the compost is to make something called the compost tea. So what you do is uh, you take a, a, a five gallon bucket, you fill compost into, typically vermicompost is used for it. You fill the vermicompost in a small sock, tie it up and use a fish aerator for bring, building air into the water. Add a little bit of jaggery for food. So you, again the same principles, water, air and food. And then keep this bag in it. The bacteria in that bag will multiply multifold. They will double every 20 minutes. So the tea that you get at the end of it, it's filled with beneficial bacteria. You can use that to uh, water your seedlings, to water your garden. Absolutely nutritious and it's a beautiful drink for your garden. So those are all levels of complications, okay? But we can begin with compost. Everyone can compost. There is really Nothing complicated about it. Take your everyday waste when it is fresh, add it with browns and put it into a bin and forget about it. And that's that. End of talk. Is it a good idea to just, uh, like everyday, everyday waste that you have, right? just grind it and then put it with browns and then put it in? All right. So if you grind it, what are you doing? You are, it'll create compaction, air. So if you make it into a very fine paste, there is no space for air. So making it into a paste will lead to rotting. Unless you have a whole bin of leaves in which you're going to mix that slurry thoroughly. It's going to be a lot of task. Chopping it fine will do it. Thank you, Nisha. No. Chopping it fine is better than making a slurry. You can, you can use a KitchenAid equipment to Chop it fine if that makes you feel good. Yeah. Thank you. It was really.
Are there any other questions? Um, Pankaj, have we missed anything? All right. Where can you get the worm? As, you, as I said, horse manure is their source. So if you know a horse farm and you get some manure home, you will get a, a few hundred worms with the manure. Okay, and horse farms are very happy to give away the horse manure. But uh, if you want to buy them, you can, uh, they sell it at Amazon, they sell it various places, there's Uncle Jim's, they, they sell it. And these worms are popularly used for fishing. So most companies that sell fishing um, uh, supplies will have them, pet stores will have them. The uh, thing to remember is that these are very delicate worms. So if you order them, they come in a fairly sad, pathetic condition when they are delivered to you. Coming in mail and in the heat, they're very unhappy. Many of them die in the journey. A few of them will be alive and they will come to life once you've put them into the bin. The best thing for you is to get, I would suggest horse manure. Just get a handful of horse manure and get it started. Or uh, the cow manure available in Lowe's and Home Depot? Cow manure is a source of the, the a earthworm in the garden, not the red wriggler. These are two different worms. See, the earthworm that you see in the garden is the one that can dig and make tunnels. It does not decompose waste. It doesn't do anything with the organic matter. But it can build nice tunnels into the yard. It will still eat organic waste and do it. But these red wrigglers are composting specialists. They will just trash down material and make it into wormy compost. And they can't dig. They're too tiny. They won't be able to dig. So they live only in the top half inch, half inch Ganesh? Six inches. Six inches, or, oh sorry, half a foot. Thanks for that Ganesh. So they live in the top six inches of the soil and they are hunted voraciously by birds. So they, don't, they won't survive. The red wrigglers won't survive in your garden. Um, but you can buy them, you can ask friends. Call me over for another uh, dinner. I will bring some worms. <laughs> Just a quick question. Um, so, is there a nutritive quality difference between a red wriggler's wormy post and the composting? That yes, as I said, um, the earth's design is for one organism to make things better for another. So, a plant will harvest sunlight and build sugars so that you can consume it. The plant doesn't eat its own produce. It's produced for somebody else. Mm -hmm. So the same is true for the vermicompost. The earthworm will eat and poop the soil, but make it ready for plants, absorbable. So when something goes through an animal's gut, its nutritive qualities change. So the vermicompost is immensely superior in quality to the normal compost. Okay. But, that's an important but, worms require taking care of. Bacteria are cool fellows. Mm -hmm. They will tolerate some amount of abuse. Worms will climb out if it gets warm. Huh? They will climb right out. So you can go to the garage and see them all on the floor because they don't like it inside. So they've decided to walk out. Okay. So they are fussy. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> you have to babysit bacteria. Yes, you have to create conditions that they like. It should be cool. You should have a. You shouldn't feed them too much food. Like if there's too much food, too much moisture, maggots will come in. Maggots will compete with the worms, and the worms will not get any food. So you have all of those problems. If it's too much moisture, they don't like it. They don't like it too cold. And as I said, they don't like onions and garlic and citrus. So you can't feed them too much, you can't feed them too little. So you have to, I mean, it, it, they produce the best compost, but they demand the pound of flesh. I, we typically use wormy compost for seedlings. That's what all of us do. We produce uh, vermicompost because it's absolutely beautiful. So when you find a plant is flowering, it needs a little nutrition, or you find the leaves yellowing, or you're doing some transplanting. Transplanting will typically add a handful of vermicompost and then transplant. You're starting your seedling tray. So we'll use the leaf mulch, the crushed leaves is decomposed, and then it becomes powdery. So you take this, you take a little bit of garden soil, you take a little bit of vermicompost, that's how we all make our seedling mix. You make it at home. So when you add vermicompost to your seedling mix, your seedlings get a very good start. So you use vermicompost like it's very precious, it really is. And use the normal compost happily. Yeah. So it's a great time for us and now we want to 
start with two ingredients with that juice. Uh, can you use worm castings from the store? Is it the same effect? Yeah, yeah. The problem with, I have only one problem with store bought stuff. They are sold in sealed plastic bags. So they are anaerobic when you bring them. There's no air inside. There's no living organism in that produce. They've all died. You take the next bin. So what you do is you transfer that. Uh, so it's a towel. So you take that and put it below. You take the new one on the top, empty one and start. So as they finish, they go below. And by the time you've come to the fourth towel, the first one is completely ready. And what you do is, uh, there are various ways to separate the worms, but you just make them into a pile. The worms will all go down. They love the dark. They'll go down. So you harvest the worm compost from the top. But you need to have a new worms for every new bag. No, 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 no. One handful of worms is enough to get started. Once you there is food, moisture, air, they will multiply. Okay, so the same the same principle. So, uh, everybody, thank you for coming here on this evening. Um, Uma, thank you. Absolutely amazing. So, uh, if, if you wanted to I learn composting, there is no better person to learn from. So, Everyone's uh, seen it. For, uh, thank you for that. Uh, the quick thing I wanted to talk about is what we have observed is we are doing this for three years now. Uh, people start, but when they start, something goes wrong and then they stop. So to overcome that, what we have started this year is we have started mentoring anybody who's interested, we have started mentoring them for composting. So we hold your hand till your first batch is cooked. So right now, about 70 families here close by are, are composting. And uh, a side effect of that composting you will see is your trash will reduce. You will go down to one small bag of trash a month. Uh, the impact of that 70 families composting is about eight tons of trash will not go into landfill this year. Eight tons is a huge amount. So we, we don't realize how much trash we produce. So if you, if somebody is interested uh, in being part of that mentor program, please do let us know. We have what three or four spots still open. Um, and, and we also, we can put you on waiting list. So if there are more people, no worries, we can get you. Uh, so the way it works is we, we teach somebody and that person promises to teach three other people. So it's as easy as that. So even if you are on waiting list in a month or so, somebody will be there to help you out. So if you are interested, that, that is what that sign up is for. So let us know, please put your name there in that sign up for, for being a mentee. So, so that we can help you in, in the composting journey. Uh, anything else? Any other questions? Last minute questions? When you compost, sometimes you're reminded of the harsh. You see this <laughs> rubber band? The rubber. <laughs> so you suddenly find, you know, labels of those, you know, they, they, they put labels on Seals, every fruit. Yeah, yeah. You'll find that label, you'll find small. Uh, zip ties and you know you realize that oh god you know, these are things that are not becoming soil so anything that's not becoming soil we want to not use too much of it so on yeah. one more question how many times do you put it on the garden uh, vegetable garden twice a year as i said twice a year twice a year yeah twice a year like in Dorapa. i just want to thank you uh both green cell and uma thank you so much that was really awesome a lot of stuff I didn't know, <laughs> like not putting worms, <laughs> garden worms into compost. I didn't know that. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming in. I thought that was really good, and I look forward to more classes. Uh, if anyone's interested, we can work in the long term about the vermicompost class specifically. Okay. And uh, sign up if you're interested um, to, to join the mentee program. Uh, I also placed a donation box there if you want to support Green Cell in their work. Um, feel free to make a donation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.